this idea, and I'll just share both of these with you. What would happen if we took an individual and we wired them, uh, connected them physiologically uh, to some form of biofeedback? And in both instances, we actually used a polygraph. Okay. So, four needle instrument, we're measuring four domains of physiological feedback. Sure. All right. Now, what if we were to, you know, give them a message that there should be a physiological response to? What, give me an example of what that might be. Okay, and in this instance, what we did was just simply say, and this was subliminal, of course, and I'll tell you how we did it, danger, danger, look out, danger. Okay, understood. Okay. Some, something that would produce right. a, a real adrenaline rush. Sure. I mean, we should have, you know, I, I mean, if it works, the fact of the matter is, with the domains we were reading, we should at least see GSR and blood pressure increases. Sure. Okay, now, what we did... <clears throat> is we enrolled our subjects this way. We're looking into evaluating the influence of relaxing music or relaxing nature, nature sounds on the stress response. Mm -hmm. So what we'd like you to do is listen for four minutes to an audio tape that will either contain music or contain ocean waves, okay. gentle ocean waves. Okay. Now, at, at the suggestion of a colleague of mine, Michael Urban, a psychologist in Idaho, uh, we also asked them to just close their eyes while they listened and let whatever thoughts come into their mind come into their mind. Okay. But kind of pay attention to it so they could report it to us later. In other words, tell us what your fantasies or your reverie or whatever you might have imagined could be. Okay. Okay? All right. Now, all of this, in part, was a distractor because what we really did was have only ocean wave tapes. Some of the ocean wave tapes had what we call a benign message. Now, I have to put this in because... This is for control. Oh, well, yeah, it's, it's kind of... Actually, it's a placebo. Sure. See, the technology that I was testing, the technology that we use, the verbal information is there. If you use a sonograph... You're going to find it. Uh, you can find it on your home stereo by panning to one side or the other. If it's Maybe science, we'll talk about that later. If it's science, it's going to have a control group. Right. So, our study took people are walking as the benign message, and okay. we every, every one minute, three times I should say. So you go 60 seconds. At the first minute, you get people are walking, or you got the danger message. Right. All right. 60 seconds later, people are walking, or the danger message. Right. All right. In every single instance, every subject that was evaluated, we had physiological feedback at the time of the danger message and nothing on people are walking. Oh, my. All right. And in fact, that's published in my book, Thinking Without Thinking, together with the graphs. Uh, that were that are the polygraph charts. How right. how now, how large? Really how, doc, interesting. Doctor, we get off. This. Okay, we'll we'll get to that. But we're coming to the top of the hour, so just oh, let me okay. ask this: How big was the uh, the entire group? Those who had the placebo, those who got the danger message. How many people? Well, there were a total of twelve in each of the pilots. All right, excellent. Um, we're at the top of the hour, so you said there was something very important. We'll pick up on that after the break. All right. All right. Sir. All right my guest is Dr. Eldon Taylor, and. What you just heard sounds to me to be absolute proof that what we're about to talk about is absolutely real. So if you ever wondered, wonder no more. From the high desert, near an area called Dreamland, this is Dreamland. Dr. Eldon Taylor is my guest. Subliminal in imaging is uh, what we're talking about. And oh my, it's fascinating. Fascinating. Even a little scary in some ways. And uh, so we'll get back to Dr. Taylor in, in a moment. Another little item, Keith from Magnetic Volcano notes a compass deviation. I'm getting other faxes now. People also noticing a compass deviation from north. Anybody out there uh, willing to check and fax me, I would appreciate that. We may be having a bit of a magnetic fluctuation right now. Back to Dr. Eldon Taylor, who is a, um, a clinical uh, a psychologist, has a Ph.D., and works with subliminal imaging, or the whole subliminal uh, field, which is a very wide one you're about to find out indeed. Here is, uh, once again, Dr. Taylor, and we were in the middle of describing that experiment, Doctor. Yeah. <clears throat> what I was about to say is, 
To me, the most interesting outcome was uh, not in the, the direct measurement, but in what we call the apperception. Because when we debriefed uh, each of the subjects, if the person had uh, received the tape with the people are walking message, they typically told us uh, themes of reverie that went like I was at the beach, it was a sunny day, hmm. I was relaxed. But if they heard the danger message, right. the theme was always fearful, violent, death-oriented. Wow. I, I, I found that uh, to be the most frightening aspect about this particular study. Oh, no, that's a real wow. Now, uh, let's say I'm a cinematographer. Let's say that I don't want to sell popcorn or any of that baloney. Let's just say that during a scene, like the famous Hitchcock scene, where the, the music's going, ah, 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 and Hitchcock. the girl's getting stabbed, uh, we put in the danger, danger, danger message. Well, then our movie carries uh, in that uh, uh, very critical portion uh, more impact, doesn't it? Indeed, and indeed, uh, that's exactly, I mean, the message itself was watch out. And it was in the Hitchcock movie, the thriller Psycho. The you're, you're, you're kidding. No, I'm not. And that's, you know, that and a whole number of other things uh, of that nature, they're <sighs> often used to heighten arousal. And, uh, and of course, a, a thriller movie, a movie is all about that. Uh, if it's not used to heighten arousal, it's used for promotional purposes. You, you leak a story that says uh, you have subliminal uh, inside this, that, or the other, and invariably people will go out and buy more. Um, to what degree do you imagine, uh, if not know, that subliminal is being used today? Now, now, this comes, of course, down to the ethics of it. I realize there are audio tapes, for example, that uh, if you want to quit smoking somehow will suggest it to you through the ocean waves. There you know you're buying subliminal messaging. Uh, you're buying it. And, but in, in our society, doctor, are we currently, do you believe we are currently using subliminal messaging without people's knowledge? Well, the answer to that is yes. I mean... Really? We find out of instances where it's used, and then we say we know about it, so it's no longer without our knowledge. But when we find out, uh, whatever it might be, whether it's, uh, you know, it's the material that we've, we talked about earlier, um, uh, the Disney kind of, of things, or, or that television commercial that's so famous uh, that ran uh, after all these FCC hearings. And this is an important point. Remember, we talked earlier about laws and rules and what you can and cannot do in broadcasting. Right. But after all of the hearings in the late 50s, 57, 58, and so on and so forth, um, a television station in Denver, Colorado, broadcast a commercial on a Saturday morning during cartoons selling toys. And the message in it was, tell mom, buy now. <laughs> okay? Because the message was slightly out of sync, yes. the, the audience thought, well, there was an outcry. Now, here's the here's part of the problem. Oh, oh you Everyone mean Everyone involved denied <laughs> knowing it. You mean, you mean it was actually visible? It, it, it became visible. Oh, So bad. there was an outcry. <laughs> now. I never heard about this. Everyone, everyone associated denies having any knowledge of it. It had to be a joke, a prankster. It shouldn't have been there. Right, of uh, course. Certainly call it back, etc. <laughs> well... The fact of the matter is, unless there is a, you know, a penalty attached, like in jurisprudence, yes. there is not normally discovery. So if everyone says, I don't know anything about it, I had to be a prankster, we'll pull it off, da-da-da-da-da, unless a station um, would be caught doing that kind of thing on a regular, blatant basis, there really is not any likelihood that there will ever be any any prevention. I understand. So it, you know, it rests in the hands of the individual. Now, every radio station in America that decided uh, when Madonna released her, you know, now famous uh, Rescue, Rescue Me, 
that decided to play it unknowingly played the subliminal lyrics that were reversed in the midnight smoke of yellow hear my melodies hail to the family it must be unknown hail hallelujah my position i love satan do you i love satan who are you whoa okay now and, and when when the madonna promotional people were approached about this because you know the information was leaked to the media uh in fact it, uh, the music was sent to me and, and we we uncovered it but a, a whole lot of radio stations uncovered it by simply you know playing the tape backwards when it was found it was uncovered and, and they were approached their answer was it was a promotional gimmick so every radio station that played the either the songs uh, rescue me or uh, justify my love technically unwilling or unwittingly participated in it like a prayer by madonna has save us satan in it well we know of course the beatles did that long ago and so what you're suggesting is when when it's discovered they say ah oh, it's just a promotional gimmick you know like the beatles did correct and so then they get away with it but on the other hand you're suggesting it absolutely works well you know i'm not no i'm not saying it absolutely works huh? i'm saying it does work very often and whenever it's linked with a congruent drive and it is combined with repetition it gains its power and so then individual person to person it becomes effective all right doctor let me lead you down one other path uh, a guest i have had on many times on the program is um uh a fellow i call mr reverse speech uh david Oates. now uh david has uh, done a, very, a lifetime, actually, of work with reverse speech. Mm -hmm. And it is his contention that one side of our brain uh, apparently not only hears this subliminal message, but transmits the subliminal message in speech. And by God, he's proven it, I don't know how many times, on this program. Now, I would think everything you have just said tonight would wind right into... Uh, David Oates research and tend to verify it. Am I wrong? Uh, no. In indeed, uh, I'm very familiar with David Oates's work and uh, you know, I'm just going to digress. Before I'd ever heard of David, we ourselves uh, believed and through some of our early work uh, thought we had uh, some revolutionary insight. David was over in Australia doing a lot more research but very specific at that mm -hmm. time. Yes. Um, but indeed part of our technology that's been studied at Stanford and Bremen and the major university, major people in, in the United States, major researchers, employs reverse speech. So the question about whether or not you can perceive reverse speech, in my, my opinion, is uh, a mute point. However, it is a contentious and controversial point, and the literature, still at large, I must admit, comes down hard opposing it. I believe David is right. What happens in the early stages of childhood development will pre predominantly to that old left-right brain model, mm -hmm. predominantly right brain oriented. It's the, the right hemisphere of our brain uh, that dominates things. And, and there isn't much contention about that. Now, as we begin to learn speech, our speech is learned in reverse. That is, it's processed in reverse. Now, the right hemisphere controls what we're going to say how the actual phonetic sound of it is, even though the left hemisphere governs the nature of language. Mm -hmm. But you must understand that until just recently, there's never been a study on how a person actually obtains the ability to talk to themselves. I mean, the first study I know about was just launched in England under a government grant, and, and that in itself is an amazing missing part of, of the whole picture. How does one have the ability to talk to themselves, modify the language, carry on the debate later, uh, so on and so forth? We, we don't know how that originates. Until we really do, these models that I'm going through, they're theoretical, but I believe justified, and I think David has an excellent case. But so, all right, that right hemisphere, if you will, is seeing language, and I'm using seeing figuratively here, not literally, mm -hmm. in reverse. 
when we acquire our full language skill, it mirrors it. What I published uh, as early as 1987 is something we call the mirror imaging paradigm, where the right hemisphere is mirroring the language over the left hemisphere. Mm -hmm. The left hemisphere then begins to articulate an understandable speech. However, if you look at the literature on speech de development, you look at Chomsky's work, you see there is a defined stage where a child will look at a parent, speak very meaningfully, and yet what they seem to be saying is gibberish. And David has taken that speech, played it in reverse, and it is indeed meaningful speech. I've heard it again and again. Okay. So my answer is yes. I, I do believe that you, we process information in reverse. In fact, in our technology, part of our patent was uh, we mask forward messages with reverse messages in a, in a shadowing method like the old dichotic listening experiments where if we play numbers into your left ear and a meaningful sentence into your right ear. I was walking down the street one day and then we switch it into your left ear continue the story a bird landed on my shoulder and kissed me on the cheek while we throw these nonsense numbers back over to the other ear what you will report hearing is the story not the words it's the way the brain operates you know if everything you say is true doctor well true is a relative word but i do believe that it is accurate then it seems to me there should be more congressional hearings I wouldn't this. disagree with that at all. In fact, in my books, I've talked about that for a long, long time, since at least 1986 when I appeared in Utah um, under this opinion, and we were able to get a bill introduced in the state of Utah that would have, and at the time I was there, uh, would have made it a law that you post a notice it was called the informed consent law. Mm -hmm. Post a notice, just like a microwave oven. You remember the days when you'd walk into a restaurant, and if they used a microwave, they had to put a notice on the window that said microwave oven in use? Yes. Just post a notice. If you're a grocery store, if you're a retailer, and you're using anti-theft messages, post a notice. We use subliminal anti-theft messages. If you're selling a video, you're selling a, a record, and it, and it contains subliminal information, post a notice. May I ask That's a, all. I, I want to ask a question. Let, uh, first of all, the, the clear implication is that they do subliminal anti-theft messaging now. Is that... The answer to that is yes. The answer is yes. yes. All right. Uh, places it do, you can go onto the web. All right. Uh, uh, in the, fact, the, there's a guy promoting it out okay, there on well, the we'll web. Okay. Hold tight. I, I, will, I, I, will, I will accept a yes for now because okay, I, want to I want to continue the question. Okay. If a notice is posted, as you suggest, uh -huh. uh, then it seems to me you've got to do another study that would, um, uh, uh, would uh, conclude one way or the other once posted does the effect then is the effect then negated is the messaging effect negated uh or even uh, perhaps um uh, the, uh, a reversal takes place and uh in the conscious mind you're fighting you're annoyed at, at the fact that you're going to get a message and so then what yeah uh and you're right uh there are a lot of studies in this whole area that need to take place and more and more of them that are taking place every day right now but the whole idea with informed consent was look if you post the notice then i know i'm alerted so i can go to the retailer and say mm -hmm. what are the messages that you're uh, playing uh for anti-theft uh, you see sometimes maybe a good anti-theft message is buying is honest but if I look at that not as an anti-theft message, but as a motivational message, what am I doing when I say buying is honest? You're encouraging uh, buying. That's correct. And if I'm a retailer, that's a marvelous way, so some say, to increase sales. Boy. Uh, this is uh, Remember again, though, the key here is linking to a congruent drive. If you can take the information, present it so that it is really there, mm -hmm. which means it's not one of these magical things, you know, on one of these tapes that you can't find anything. It's really there so that it's registered by the individual, even though they have not perceived it, and that's how we're defining it in this instance. 
and link it to that congruent drive, it's going to affect their decision making for some period depending upon that individual and its repetition. I would presume that decision making in all kinds of areas would be possible. Another big one would be sex. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I would suppose that that's true. I don't think that there's been any studies in that area, but let me give you one that might uh, address that issue. In, in psychology, there's a theory of psychology within cognitive co psychology that is called the top-down model or proceeding, if you will, in context. Um, and, and much of our perception is context. One of the preeminent cognitive psychologists in the country, uh, in the world, is a man by the name of Peter Kruse at the Univer Bremen University in Germany. Mm -hmm. Using our technology, Peter was able to change the perception of within context to without a context. And say that another way. What it comes down to is if you can alter a person's context, you fundamentally have begun to alter the way they view the world, All right, maybe I, their I, belief system. Doctor, I'm going to have to pick that one apart so I understand it. Uh, we're on a break, so uh, stay right there. We're going to have to pick that one apart and see how it relates to sex. Thing compass deviations uh, to 10 degrees and more. And so if this is in a future broadcast, I don't want to... Um, uh, alarm anybody or alert even alert anybody in the future uh, falsely uh, it is November 2nd that we are getting these compass deviations if you uh, have a compass and you're able to check uh, so far it is it seems limited to the west coast and one has to speculate and wonder a little bit if the uh, geo uh, activity the uh, earthquakes um, that we've been experiencing experiencing on the California Nevada border might somehow wind into this that's just a a wag or a guess <laughs> we'll get back to our guest Dr. Eldon Taylor and what he's had to say so far has been absolutely in my opinion shocking even a little scary when you realize the implications of it and I had asked him about sex and he uh, doctor you went off in an area that I'm going to have to ask you to explain more carefully because I just didn't understand it so okay. reduce it if you would to to English <laughs> sorry most, most well all perception uh, for the human condition um, sorts itself in an order we call context where sex is concerned in our society there's two things that are relevant here the first one is at least I could say this with absolute certainty 30 years ago it was a taboo in our society uh, it should still be uh, most of us think that it is one of the taboos that our early sexual drives etc should be properly sublimated or acted out in some socially acceptable way right okay? all right now uh, the second one <clears throat> is that we have a threshold of arousal. Uh, our threshold of arousal has to do with how much stimuli we see. Right. So if I look, for example, if I look back at sex as an issue 20, 30 years ago, what would have been sexy, I'll put the words in quotation marks, arousing, is rather bland and boring for television today. Yeah, that, that's for sure. So there has been a significant difference or change, if you will, in how much stimuli it takes or stimulus it takes for our threshold of arousal to be excited. Okay, gotcha. All right. Now, within the context model, if I change a person's context of what sexuality is if i can take it away from the taboo if i can if i can frame it into uh, uh, the kind of context where it is not a taboo or it is less of a taboo or where it is even desirable let's take for an instance there is um, an actual advertisement that i show the color development of a, it was airbrushed in in an ad that um appears in my book thinking without thinking the artist conceptualization explanation shows a woman shows this woman in a position with her eyes in the air very specifically described so that she would appear to be below you 
And the rest of the picture um, is designed to make you think in terms of her wishing to please. So there are some bondage elements, etc. And by positioning her eyes like that, she is supposed to be assuming an oral position. Okay, I, okay? I get the picture. All right. By changing the context of an environment, we we often can change the value system. Now, and when I say environment, I mean a mental environment. Oh, no. I. Uh, hey, look, listen. Remember the 60s? Yes. Yes, very well. I was born the same year you were, sir. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yeah. I wonder if we were imaged into it. Well... And then I've got to wonder if today we're not being imaged out of it. <laughs> <laughs> You, you get, of course, you get a lot of issues mixed here. You know, we, we have our icons, and there were icons in the 60s. Good, bad, or indifferent, there were icons. Um, one of the things that we find with young people today is they're absent icons. Mm -hmm. But an icon, you know, tends not to be subliminal. When we combine everything together, we combine that which we call liminal, that which we call supraliminal, it's there, you could see it, you just didn't see it, uh, that which we call subliminal, we, we combine the direction that we see in this entire area, it's very difficult to come down and say that somehow sex, is, the context of sex has changed. Um, but it has. It has. There's no question about that. So then, once again, you could, uh, as you just described, subliminal, uh, uh, give a subliminal suggestion to somebody uh, that the image they're seeing uh, is conveying a, a context of w wanting to please or to have sex with a person watching this. Well, I mean, the answer is yes, you can do that. I, th I think it's going to be done more to associate an arousal with a product. Uh, oh, but yeah, like a there car. are people that actually offer programs that they guarantee, you know, are going to do this kind of thing. And well, so, I, I can think of two. But a researcher isn't going to run that kind of study. I understand, but I can think of two immediate applications. One is to sell cars. We all know that uh, they use women in commercials up front, not masked in any way, uh, dressed in very sexy ways to sell cars, you know, to get guys uh, to think that if they have this car, then uh, they will get that girl. Yeah. And now, that, that's one application. The other application... And research shows, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but research shows you put that pretty girl with a car, men will report the car as being better looking, a faster <laughs> car, or da 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 all <laughs> kinds of things not associated with a car. <laughs> the other application would be during a love or sex scene in a motion picture. Wouldn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. That would be a theoretical application, mm -hmm. without a doubt. Um, my, 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 my. What are we going to do with all this? I don't here? know, but you know, we talk a lot about the fearful side. And, and there is, I think, anything uh, that, you know, as a tool is, is like a scalpel. It has a positive and it has a, has a negative. And, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of positive applications to this technology. Mm-hmm. I can see that. Uh, any, a, a, most any technology that is extremely powerful has positive and negative applications. Uh, nuclear power is one of them. I, I mean, we can irradiate people and many times eradicate a cancer, save their life. Or we can drop a bomb on a city and kill millions. Absolutely right. So any, any powerful technology has uh, pluses and, and minuses, good and bad yin and yang, the problem I see here is that w w the controversy has just about uh, ruled out any legislation or control on the negative side. Well, you know, I think the controversy is going to continue for some time. That's just a fact. And then it will it prevent... In, in an embryonic developing area. Then it will prevent any control. Uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, the First Amendment decision, although it has been criticized by some, uh, is, is probably the first step in, in protecting uh, people. You see, it can be argued that a subliminal message, if it is 
perceivable, and I'll put that word in quotation marks. In other words, if you can recover it, get it off of the material, yeah. or if a person says, says it, even if they didn't know it was on it, but they say it, you could argue this is not subliminal. And they, they tried to argue that in front of Whitehead and Reno. Okay? All right, all right. Please uh, review for all of us, since you've mentioned it several times now, the decision in Reno. What case was that, and what was the result? The oh, I'm sorry. Um, this was the CBS Judas Priest case, the infamous uh, um, subliminal message, the Do It Command that was within the stained glass album, the musical piece was Better By You, Better Than Me. The lyrics, uh, I don't believe anybody disagrees, overtly encourage suicide. Uh, tucked within those lyrics was a command, do it. That command was deemed by the court to be subliminal. It was argued not to be there by CBS and, and Judas Priest, but when demonstrated to be there, then it was argued to be a coincidence of sound, not something that was intentionally placed on the record. And the decision? Uh, the court's decision was this. There is a subliminal message. Uh, the subliminal message is, do it. This is uh, a wrongful death action. You must prove that CBS intended to put it there, uh, and you did not prove that. All right. Um, if they had Actually, been able... there were four things, and I don't mean to cut you off, there were four things that should have been proven. The other one was it had to be proven that the stimuli itself was sufficient to cause the death. It's like having to prove malicious intent. Uh, well, yes, correct. And in that, we, we, you know, that is, CBS uh, never brought forth the original 24-track master, and without that, you couldn't prove one way or another whether it was a coincidence of sound or not. Uh -huh. uh, they were fined for impeding the judicial process by the judge, but, you know, the amount of fine is so, what, $40,000? Well, let's to, say, to for the that. sake of our discussion right now, that they had been able to prove uh, what I would call malicious intent, that uh, indeed it had been done on purpose. Now, would that then fall still under uh, the First Amendment? In other words, would the person putting it in uh, ha have a First Amendment right had, to do so? Had Whitehead determined that the message was not subliminal... Well, then, you know, it would, it's a freedom of speech, yes. I mean, for all intent and purposes, uh, freedom of speech... Um, yeah, but who says freedom of speech doesn't cover a subliminal it, message? I, well, and see, that was the whole issue. The contention of, of the uh, CBS people their attorneys, their expert, was this was not a subliminal message. I understand that. Okay. Uh, even though it took sophisticated equipment to uncover it. Once you could uncover it, they said, now, see, it's not subliminal, it's really there, and it could have been heard. The fact that Vance and Belknap started chanting do it before they shot themselves was proof on the CBS argument that, you see, they heard it. They admit hearing it. They knew it was there. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir, I do, but you haven't answered my question. I'm I mean, sorry, I even, even forward, if I were to say, jump off a cliff, mm -hmm. jump off a cliff, mm -hmm. and some Looney Tunes out there went and jumped off a cliff somewhere, and the parents said, well, he did it because Art Bell said jump off a cliff. That's right. If you recorded a piece of music, Art Bell, live, here's, here's my greatest music to uh, uh, jump off a cliff, and somebody played your music, they bought your music, they listened to your music, and they jumped off the cliff, I'm afraid that would be freedom of speech. And, I mean, um, they made that election when they bought that piece of material. Well, how do you differentiate... commentary. How do you differentiate between the Nazis marching and that being free speech? I don't uh, think and, you do. And, I'm on and, your team. and subliminal messaging. How do well, you... Uh, see, I have a real problem myself, especially looking at, like, this danger message. I, I have a real problem with this whole thing, and, and, and part of it is, let's assume that you prove that it's there, as you do. Right. And, and let's assume that you had the 24-track master and you proved that it was intentionally placed there. Yes. Okay? So what? Now, at that point, the next thing you're going to have to prove is that it was a causal factor in the death. Now, listen. 
What's going to happen is they're going to say, this person that played Art Bell's Jump Off the Cliff tape, well, they must have been predisposed to commit suicide anyway. Mm -hmm. See, because the same person wouldn't have done it. Now, and, and listen... If, as in the instance of Vance and Belknap, if if you came from a de, you know dysfunctional family of sorts, if you used alcohol as teenagers, if you smoked a little marijuana, if you'd been in a fist fight, uh, you know, well, you're you're definitely going to be an at risk, and and they were at risk. I'm not making light of that. All right, where I'm going with all of this, where I'm trying to go is, uh, let's let's just say for the sake of discussion that absolutely it's there. And um, is it, once you've said absolutely it's there, is it or is it not then, in your opinion, still protected by the First Amendment uh, uh, to the Constitution? No, and Whitehead determined that regardless of CBS's efforts and their arguments in open court to the effect that it was protected by the First Amendment, in fact, he put to them the fact that he just said, you mean you could sell us a politician that way? Well, and their response was, and, and this whole thing is in my book, Thinking Without Thinking in Detail, but the whole, the response was, in this genre, uh, well, we could, but we wouldn't. Okay? Whitehead ruled, no, that is a violation of First Amendment, and that is the first hard anything that we have that, that gives us a clear bell that says, a violation of, this uh, is unacceptable. Doctor, a violation of the First Amendment, um, in what sense? Uh, well, actually, Whitehead addresses that in, in several different senses, but, but the, the theme of it goes like this, as opposed to the legal aspect. The theme of it goes like this. An individual has a right to free speech, but everyone else in society has a right to turn that speech off. Mm -hmm. But in order to turn the speech off, they must know the speech is present. If... If they don't know it's present, you have obviated their right to free speech by not giving them the right to turn it off. Do you think that the, that, that decision uh, would hold through the high court? Well, I believe it would. I, I do believe it would. But then, you know, I'm not an attorney. That's, uh, you know, who knows? Uh, I, the answer to that, who knows? Well, this is just absolutely remarkable. Uh, remarkable. Then, uh, if that's true, and if that court decision would hold, then maybe we don't need the congressional hearings and the specific protections under the law uh, well, against this sort of subliminal messaging. I don't see, and here comes the other thing now. <clears throat> Remember that in this case, you had to show that this was a causal factor. Right. And And... It had to be, you know, not just an association of a whole bunch of things. You, you had to be able to say, this caused the suicide. The final straw. This mm -hmm. was it. Mm -hmm. Bang. Beyond a shadow of a doubt. Yes. That's going to be really, really tough to do in any, you know, dynamic sense. And this was a wrongful death action. Now, let's, let's go back and let's say that somebody sells you a videotape and it has a message on it as you used. Or somebody uses it uh, as an anti-theft message. Or a car lot is using it to to try and get you to buy, okay? <laughs> yes. Oh, well, there's guys on the web that are advertising that they've got custom-tailored programs to help you sell cars that way, okay? All right, so <clears throat> let's assume it's used like that. Little let's things assume... like I can imagine, like, good good tires, good transmission. Right. <laughs> okay, now, now, it's used that way. <clears throat> and you discover it's used that way, and you say, hey, that's a violation of my First Amendment. Uh -huh. So what? What's the... What's the penalty? Oh, well... See, until there is some kind of... Damage. Uh, well, yeah, until there is a damage, there isn't an action. And if you argue that the damage was I bought the car... I bought uh, a lemon. And I would and not have. I, I wouldn't have bought this car had it not been for your message. Now There's, you're in a civil suit. There is damage. Okay, and now you're in a civil suit. So you're just suing a car dealer like you're suing for selling you a lemon in the first place, but you're bringing in some other, you know, tangential relationship, right? Mm hmm Until and unless state, local government, federal government says, look, if you use this to sell a product, if you use this without informed consent, it shall be deemed a misdemeanor. Mm hmm It shall be finable subject to. Until that's spelled out, so what? 
unless you're really <laughs> looking at bringing another wrongful death action and and able to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that that was the final straw. That would be very, very difficult to do. You're absolutely correct. All right. Um, it has been an extremely enlightening two hours. We're at the uh, top of the hour once again. My guest is Dr. Eldon Taylor, and we're talking about subliminal messaging. And I must say, everything I, or nearly everything I thought about it, uh, is obviously wrong. And this is a great power that can be used for great good or great harm. And when we come back, we will discuss some of the great good it might be used for, and then we'll start to take calls. How's that? I'm Art Bell from the high desert in an area near Dreamland. This is Dreamland. We're going to open the lines here in a moment. You've got the numbers. You know how to reach me. And when you do, you'll reach Dr. Taylor. When it comes to information on ETs, if you're like me, you can't get enough. I'm telling you, you have got to see the spine-chilling video. Area 51, the alien interview. Thousands of you have already ordered this 65, underline that 65-minute documentary. Um, I'm just blown away by a lot of what you've had to say tonight. I'm honestly blown away. And I'm going to be thinking about this uh, for some time. And obviously, we could spend hours uh, talking about the implications and areas... Uh, in your research that we haven't even touched on yet. Maybe we do it another time. I'd love to. Uh, we're almost going to have to do that. I, I, I want to turn some of the questions over to the audience and allow them to ask you uh, questions, and maybe that'll help us uh, in, a, in another show and, you know, at some soon future date, uh, believe me, to, uh, uh, to delve into. So if you don't mind, we'll go to the phones. No, that's great. All right, good. Here we go. First time caller line. You're on the air with Dr. Taylor. Hi, Art and Dr. Taylor. Hello. This is Merrick in Santa Monica. Yes, Mark. By the way, Art, I want to thank you on behalf of all your listeners about those 130 Vietnamese orphans you once rescued. <laughs> I don't think people know about that generally. Well, thank you. Okay, but I've noticed in my own work, because I do a lot of interviewing myself, Dr. Taylor, that um, sometimes when I listen to voices at different speeds, words that I actually hear as yes will sound like no when the person really is just saying yes in agreement with you. And uh, have you had any contacts like that, any experience like that? Uh, not, not per se, not listening at different speeds. I, I don't tend to uh, experiment so much with the different speeds, but I'll share something with you that is uh, in line with uh, the work of David Oates when you say that. Uh, years ago when uh, I was uh, practicing lie detection, uh, I had, you know, tape recordings of uh, interviews, and it wasn't at all uncommon for a subject uh, uh, approaching confession to close their body, language up, maybe lower their head, and speak very softly, something that might be very incriminating. And mm. So <clears throat> we, re we routinely, routinely recorded all of it, and uh, I used a an ooh hair recorder that would slow the speech down from 15 uh, ips to uh, um, seven and a half. Se well, actually, it would slow it clear down to 15 16 Art. Oh my! Uh, you know, this is the the ooh hair, the famous cloak and dagger mm -hmm. uh, little recorder. But uh, at any rate, um, in listening to a response, Mark. <clears throat> The first time I ever heard what I would say is an example of Oates's reversal was a clear no response to a, a relevant question. And in this instance, it happened to be a, rom, uh, 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 a burglary. So it would have been, did you commit this burglary? And the answer was no. But when turning it with my finger backwards repeatedly right at that response so I could hear it clearly, playing it again, each time I just flip it back, I would hear clearly, liar, liar. <laughs> now that may seem, you know, a little far-fetched. And at the time I thought, what is this? Um, it, it, to me it was totally an anomaly. This was back in the, you know, mid-70s, uh, late 70s, somewhere in that area, before I'd ever begun to think of this whole idea of uh, speech reversals and how they might affect 
learning. Uh, that's that's the only experience I've had, sir. All right. Um, very good. Uh, wild card line, you're on the air with Dr. Eldon Taylor. Where are you calling from, please? Hi, Eric. This is Dave in Cape Coral, Florida. Hi, Dave. Yeah, uh, I think a good uh, test for this would be in prisons and jails to see if you can make the prisoners more docile. And I wonder if any uh, testing has been done with something like that. Good question. Doctor? In indeed, Dave. Uh, the first... You see, I came to this originally as a opponent. I mean, I thought it would be a marvelous idea if it would work, but I didn't really believe it would. But there was enough literature for me to proceed. And my whole idea was, can you make a tape that would influence someone in interrogation under a lie detection scenario, influence them so that if they were honest, situational stress factors would be reduced and if they were dishonest you know maybe we'd have some hyper reactions it would be real easy to read and it would make it easy um, because I worked from that vein the first application that I saw for the use of the technology once that had all been sorted down as to what the technology really was was at the Utah State Prison where we employed a double blind study the study was designed um, to lower um, hostility aggression levels. Mm. It was designed to do that by offsetting two scores that we saw as a common denominator among all inmates. And let me digress. I had associates involved helping me, and one of the people, Charles McCusker, administered uh, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory across the inmate population in what is known as uh, the 288 or Youth Offenders Facility. Now, these were all volunteers, and so there were 60 subjects, three groups of 20. In <clears throat> the common denominator was um, what we call high self-alienation, social alienation responsibility. Uh, it's easy to hear, and often you do hear from an inmate, ah, but for the grace of God, there go you. I mean, what else could I do? Uh, my mommy was a prostitute, my daddy was an alcoholic, and the neighbor boy hung heroin on me. Now, that's an exaggeration. They're, they always have an excuse for why they're there. We've got so, the picture, yeah. Okay, we implemented the study based on that, creating affirmations designed uh, to, to strengthen, if you will, self-image, to build a positive, healthy self-image, to remove this blame possibility so that an individual took responsibility for their actions. Whatever happened to you in your life, you're making a decision right this minute um, on what you're going to do about that. So <clears throat> what we found was not only was it successful in that area, but the prison was excited enough about these findings that they spread it throughout the prison system. They installed hundreds of tapes and, and players. They use those and dispense them to this day using their, or through their uh, SSW, MSW people or their custodial care people. And that is spread from that prison to other prisons like Chowchilla in California. Does that answer your question, Dave? Wow. Yeah. Uh, what does the uh, ACLU have to say about that? They might be... Yeah, I, that's where well, I, that's where I go, to too. You have to understand that within the prison, it is not done covertly or against uh, an inmate. We have a whole protocol set up for it, and it goes like this. Because, I mean, an inmate has rights, too. Uh, let's assume that you're an inmate in the inmate population. Okay. And uh, for all intent and purposes, you're going to be reviewed on a regular basis uh, by a caseworker. Yes. Typically, that's an SSW, yes. a social worker. Yes, okay? I, I want to get paroled. Okay, that's right. Everybody wants early release. That's right. Okay? All right. Now, let's assume that... We set up a reward incentive program, and essentially it goes like this. If you're clean and there are no violations, we'll make available to you a Walkman with headphones, and you can choose one of maybe a half a dozen titles that will assist you in, you know, rehabilitating yourself and taking responsibility for your actions. Yes. In, in the print, we even have... Um, weight gain and weight lifting programs because yes. hey if that's what it takes for them to come to it fine we fine. also include on every one of these programs responsibility affirmations all right all right does, so does, does if it you say... want to get to them you have to go to your social worker wait a minute hold it hold yeah. it doctor hold it 
does it include in the information given to the inmates that these affirmations will be subliminal? Uh, absolutely. They know it's subliminal. They know what the affirmations are. So, and they get it from the caseworker, and they get it if they want to. Now, what happens is everybody ends up wanting it. Now, whether they want it because they want to impress their social worker, or they want it because they truly want to rehabilitate, that's a whole other question. No. The fact of the matter is, they request it. It becomes the kind of thing they all want. Uh huh. I know, but there's undue pressure. Uh, I I don't know that that's true. You know. I, well, I, I mean, I, if, I, the, if the inmate uh, believes that if he participates in this program, takes the tape, that he will be more likely uh, to be considered rehabilitated and then paroled then, in a way, that's undue pressure. Uh, perhaps. I don't, I don't know. You see, first of all, there's no representation of that kind made to him. Second I, I of all... I understand that. Okay. But, but so, how, whatever they, they devise in their mind as, as their method to impress you as the caseworker, mm -hmm. they have devised. That's one half of it. The second half of it is we have to understand our penology system doesn't currently work, and these guys typically learn to be better criminals. Oh, no, I rate is very high. They're going to come out and be our neighbors. You know, at some point, we as society also have to take responsibility. I am all for their rights, but I'm also all for our rights. Let me, let me give another instance here. We have children in the world, and I'm going to call them children. They're 14, 15, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. They're picking up shotguns. They're walking into school systems, and they're blowing principals' heads off. I know that. All right. Now, in Jacksonville, Florida, they have the highest drop rate in the, in the nation. Mm -hmm. And they also have one of the highest juvenile offender rates. And they have a floor in the jail that is where they hold juveniles who are being tried for adult crimes. Okay? Eh? 14, okay. 15, these are sure. kids, children. I understand. They're children at their hours. You bet. Okay. Now, Florida is mandated, the educational system there is mandated to educate these people. These children typically do not wish to be educated. Mm -hmm. They're not interested in being instructed in any way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. We recently employed a study. Again, they volunteered, and they may have motives such as, well, if I volunteer, maybe, you know, I won't have to go to prison, maybe, you know, this will look good to the judge, da-da-da-da-da-da-da. They volunteered. But of 22 subjects that volunteered to participate, yes. listening to an audio program assisting them, this was a subliminal program we created to assist them mm -hmm. in learning, studying, to pass the GED, mm -hmm. 20 of them passed it. Mm -hmm. Now that's unheard of, 20 of 22. I agree with okay. you. All right. Now you can stop and come back to the high ground and say, yeah, but there was maybe undue pressure. I don't disagree with you, Art. I don't disagree. It is a real moral conundrum. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's hard to say it can't or shouldn't be done when the results are like that. <laughs> well... You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm going to really have to think a lot about this, Dr. Taylor. I can almost see Dr. Eldon Taylor as uh, a chief, um, uh, uh, perhaps the chief advisor to whoever it is who's uh, running the one world government that lays ahead you know, somewhere. <laughs> I know that's taking it to a grand extreme I hope not, sir. As I tell you what, I've read your book, Awakening, and I agree with it. Uh, I was raised quickening. a redneck. I'm not a bleeding heart. I understand. Uh, no, it's called the quickening, by the way. Pardon me? Oh, I know that. I know that. I just, I, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know where the line is, honestly, and I guess that's where, I, where I'm coming from. I, I don't know I when, appreciate your honesty. I, I don't know when we should jump in there and try and help these people and when. You, I mean, you're absolutely right. There is, of course, an implied influence. Of course, these people are not saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm depressed and I want to get off the drugs, so I'm going to get a depression tape because I right. heard they did this study on that. And they yeah, exactly. popping out $15 for it. No, yep. no, no, no. This is, this is a different context, and I agree with you. It's a tough one. It's a real tough one. How does your work, uh, before we go on to other calls, uh, I notice it mentions in here, um, 
that your work might, for example, relate to forensic hypnosis, uh, which Whitley Strieber underwent? Well, it, it, when I was uh, practicing, uh, when I was a lie detection examiner investigation, involved in investigations, one of my specialties was forensic hypnosis. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I used forensic hypnosis in many instances, uh, indeed, you know, including homicide uh, cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what we found was, uh, you know, it, when a person is in whatever state you want to call it, if we technically deal with the literature of hypnosis, we call it in a hyper-suggestible state. Right. But when you're dealing with forensic hypnosis, you're doing everything in the world to avoid any suggestion mm -hmm. of any kind whatsoever. So there we, we think of it as a hypernesic state or a state of so much relaxation and that it's easier for us to remember things without undue stresses and and whatever else. I don't see hypnosis as a magical state. I see it as a natural state of reverie that everybody experiences. Um, uh, it is, it's a brainwave state that's identified as alpha and theta, and a deep subject is, you know, in the slower ranges, but typically everybody is in this 8 to 14 cycle alpha uh, that experiences hypnosis. <clears throat> what I learned out of hypnosis, however, is some of the things that the mind is capable of, absolutely capable of. Um, you know, it's common for people to talk today about mind-body connection, for example. Oh, yes. And, and my book on wellness is all about, you know, the mind-body connection. And I began by drawing on my experiences as a forensic hypnotist, where I would see physiological differences in a person uh, when they began to remember certain things and that made me think of my own life experiences and well now we go on to another story but uh, that's how forensic hypnosis ties into my background all right I am told uh, that in a state in a hypnotic state a person will not do something that they have um, basic uh, a basic will not to do or they don't want to do is that is that true or false I'm going to get into some trouble here. Well, I'm going right. to shoot that's from the hip and tell you what I believe. All right, please. Okay. <clears throat> Everybody in the industry wants to tell you, a potential subject, that you will do nothing uh, in a state of hypnosis that you wouldn't otherwise do. Correct. And if you have to challenge them and say, well, yes, but I saw this stage hypnotist and he had these people behaving like chickens and things, mm -hmm. he's going to respond the hypnotist that is and say but they really wanted to do that you see they're probably uh, the kinds of people have the kinds of personality that they like to their the hands. center of attention right you know? their hands they like yeah. the attention yeah <clears throat> there is some research that will support this view if you change the context of an individual in a state of hypnosis provides sufficient authority and or, I should say, provide sufficient authority, I believe you will conduct yourself in a way that you wouldn't otherwise do. Well, let me clarify that. All right, well, there's not going to... No one is going to kill. I'm not going to say that. You and I are not going to go out and kill our neighbor today. Uh -huh. But if in a state of hypnosis, I can convince you that you are defending or protecting a loved one, you're going to act in a way within that context that you wouldn't ordinarily act. All right, you just said it. I, I've been saying that for years. Uh, doctors, stand by. There's more to come. If you have questions for Dr. Elvin Taylor, uh, that's what our phone lines are for if you're able to get through. And we'll give you the numbers coming out of the bottom of the hour once again. What a show. I'm Art Bell, and this is Dreamland. And um, I want to give you a chance to plug it. Uh, what is the name of your book? Well, the one we spent most of the time speaking about this evening yes. is Thinking Without Thinking. Thinking Without Thinking. Uh, boy, what a, what a right-on title, yes. Thinking Without Thinking. Um, and where is it available? How do they get it? Well, they can call the 800 number, 1-800-964-3551, and order it online right now. Uh, let me... It's 1-800-964-3551? Uh, how much is your book? Twenty-seven ninety-five. It's four hundred and sixty-five pages, including all the hearings and you know the judicial findings that we talked about, or everything we're talking about. It's what the book's about. And the answer to your question is, we.
We don't own too many of our own thoughts. <laughs> um, what about what I just... We, we, we talked about the First Amendment, and surely there is an application there, a question there. But what about the Fourth Amendment? Uh, isn't there possibly a violation there as well? In other words, if you have caused me to think a thought, that I would not otherwise think, buy a product I would not otherwise buy, or even commit an action I would not otherwise commit, then have you not invaded my privacy? I would think so, but, you know, that's the theoretical subject for attorneys. I'm certainly <laughs> not an attorney, but I'll tell you why. <laughs> well, I can see this whole thing is going to end up in the hands of attorneys. I, I believe that it, ends, it, it needs to end up in the hands of people. And, I mean, what it's going to take is enough people to be concerned, as I am, as you are, mm -hmm. to make enough noise for anything to ever happen in this state. And it, is, it has to be sincere noise, not the kind that, you know, is the outcry of, of uh, the Vickery Theater that we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. but the kind that follows up on a systematic way. And the, and the kind that demands, uh, you know, evidence uh, one way or the other. Well, I mean, so we learn somebody uses it. Uh, let's let's take for example the famous stained glass uh, album by uh, Judas Priest. Sales skyrocketed during that trial. That didn't hurt them. They saw you couldn't buy, find that album I'm anywhere. I'm sure. I'm sure that's correct. Yes. I'm sure that's correct, but it, it doesn't bear on these greater, gigantic uh, questions, these ethical uh, questions, constitutional questions, as a matter no, of fact. No, it doesn't, but it bears directly on the amount of responsibility each of us are willing to take in what we consider to be the greatest country on the, on the planet. It's like ban a book and everybody will want it, of course. Um, that's universally true. Uh, uh, march up and down and pick it in front of a movie uh, for some reason or another. Get the public aroused, and you will get more people to go to the movie. That's always been true. Uh, let's go back to the phones real quickly. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Taylor. Good uh, good evening. Well, hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Jim. Hello, Art. Uh, Art. Hello, Dr. Taylor. Where are you, Jim? Uh, I'm in Chicago. Okay. Now, uh, the one point that I, you know, that I haven't heard brought up is just how long... Uh, the you know subliminal messages of some type had actually been used, especially advertising. Now, if I'm not mistaken, it's probably over 20 years ago when the book Subliminal Subduction or Seduction was written, and of course its sequel, The Clan Plate Orgy. Um, work. Now, I've okay, I've long since forgotten who the author of the book is. Wilson Brian are. Key. Um, Pardon? Wilson Brian Key. Yes, thank you. Uh, anyway, uh, he's, he's a, actually stating that uh, subliminal techniques were used as, as long ago as actually in classical art. <coughs> so. Well, that, that may be. Uh, it may be, and it may be that it has been used uh, and is being used right now all over the place. I, I think the title to your book is uh, probably a good one, Thinking Without Thinking. How are we to discern? Is there any way? That's a pretty good question, Doctor. Is there any way to discern whether your thoughts are your own? Well, I, I think the first thing, the first way to answer that question is to assume that any thought that we have that is not a constructive, positive thought, we have the opportunity to change. That's just... That's, that's free, uh, free will, sure. Okay. But again, that doesn't it directly address my if question. If the thought is not a constructive, positive thought, I would make it a suspect thought. <laughs> it would be a suspect thought for two reasons. The first one is, look, as a pragmatist, it's self-sabotaging. The second one is, um, you know, where did it get voiced on me? You see, a lot of our thinking process has nothing to do with subliminal. It's just the nature of how we're raised. We're raised basically in a no-don't syndrome. You know you can't do this, don't mm -hmm. do that, you're not old enough for this, you're never right. going to be smart enough for this, da 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 da, -da. Right. And we carry all of that in our inner talk. Every one of your listeners can do a little experiment I've done hundreds of times. You just say to yourself, very quietly, very sincerely, I am good. Be still for a minute. And see if you don't get a stream of thoughts coming back. Some of which may go like this, good at what? Good for what? <laughs> do you remember when? 
And if you say something even more, like everybody today is focused on riches. I, I don't know why, be, but we'll, I'll leave that. That's a whole other subject we get into. But if you say to yourself, I'm going to make a million dollars, and you say that seriously, because maybe you just bought this series of tapes that you saw in some infomercial for $200, it's going to make you super successful. Mm. You can go out there and buy all the cars you want and so on and so right, forth. Right, right. When you say it to yourself sincerely, what comes back? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, that, you're right. That's a whole other show. West of the Rockies, you're on the air with Dr. Eldon Taylor. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, where, where are you, please? Uh, my name's Tony, calling from San Diego. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Taylor, uh, in speaking up, using this for good, I have a severe anxiety and depression disorder from childhood. Emphasis on the anxiety, severe. Are there subliminal tapes that would be of substantial help to me? And if so, where could I get them? Well, the answer to that is a yes and a no, and I'm going to equivocate for this reason. Okay. First of all, any and all of the programs, like I'm going to tell you about a depression program that we did a double-blind study on uh, in Colorado. <clears throat> and uh, depression is almost always attenuated with heightened anxiety. Um, but any and all of these programs are not replacements for health care. I want to really stress that. Okay. Uh, you, you, they can assist you. They're they're used by healthcare professionals as ancillary aids to augment your care, etc. But now, in answer to your question, with that caveat, uh, we ran a double-blind study. In, actually, the study was conducted by um, Kim Roche of Phoenix University, I said Colorado, and I'm sorry. And uh, the study, uh, and I'm, I'm giving you the wrong information. It was Colorado State University, and it's just got to be my gavel response to an hour. Five minutes into this thing. The study was designed to look at clinically depressed patients mm -hmm. who had not responded favorably to whatever care or treatment they were in. Okay. And these patients, some of them were in psychotherapy, so they, they got you know the visit with a psychologist. Some of them were being treated by psychiatrists. They were being treated, therefore, with medication as well as um, psychotherapy. <clears throat> the nature of the study was this. And, and, and when we were all said and done, the only new variable was the introduction of a Freedom from Depression audio program we created that is now commercially available. <clears throat> After 17 hours of usage, and the protocol called for an hour a day every day. After 17 hours of usage, we had statistically different findings. And this is on the basis of pre and post tests using a Beck depression scale, mm -hmm. the psychometric. <clears throat> The, such that in many instances a patient was moved from clinically depressed to non-clinically depressed but every single patient responded favorably that employed the program for the 17 hours now if they didn't use the 17 hours there was no effect uh, well even with your caveat that is a remarkable, remarkable result. Well, let me add uh, something else. You know, I just got a fax, and actually it was email a couple of days ago from some people in Mexico that have, that represent this technology. They took it to, basically, uh, medicine there is uh, socialized and uh, government supported, and, we, you know, it's a broke economy. Um, it, it is now a part and parcel. It's in their catalog, goes to to their healthcare professionals, a number of different titles where there has been experimental evidence to show efficacy, because what it is, in addition to professional health care, is an inexpensive take-home care. It, it, it's, and in that sense, it, it, to me, it has tremendous potential value. Doctor? Yes. Uh, just answer this absolutely honestly, if you would. I'll answer them all absolutely okay, honestly. Okay, fine. Even if they get me in trouble, Suppose sir. Suppose... Suppose, uh, instead of being a good guy, I was not a good guy, and I decided that I wanted to use subliminal messaging to make people sick. Well, let me answer it with a little bit of a story, real quick. Last night I had dinner with Pat and Gail Flanagan. You know who they are? You talked about their device, a neurophone. Yes. Pat Flanagan said to me, Eldon, <clears throat> you know, there's no way you could use the Neurophone to do brainwashing. And I said, Pat, I don't want to disagree with you, but I'm going to. And I told him about our danger study. 
And I said, now, what if we took the neurophone and we used a danger stimulus of that nature? Would you agree with me that what's going to happen is the individual is going to have a heightened state of arousal. That heightened state of arousal is going to produce an anxiety, uh, fight-flight response. Uh, that fear could lead to um, heightened hostility and aggression. I mean... Um, no, that's that, a, that, listen, no, no, that's at the bottom of the scale. I'm talk, talking about something far more serious. Suppose, I, I, you, you talked a little while ago about the mind-body connection, right? Mm-hmm. So the answer is yes. The answer is yes, in my opinion. I'm going to say to you, yes, I God. think sickness is sold, America. Indeed, if you want to see some interesting data, take a look at pharmaceutical companies that sell, you know, cold care. The minute they go up on television and tell you, coming to town is a new virus, and it's going to, you know, a new flu, and it's going to get you, and da-da-da-da-da. I da, know, da, da, I know, da, I know. I know, I know. You for yourself, the sales skyrocket. I know. You are sold to expect to be ill. I, I, yeah, I, I, there's a lot of data on that. In fact, it's in my book, Wellness, you know, and it's a little book for five ninety five. They can get it the same 800 number. Is that permissible? Uh, it is. Okay, sir. Uh, it is. Uh, it's 1-800-964-3551. Boy, have you given me a lot to think about. Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with Dr. Taylor. Hi. Hello? Hello there. Where are you? Uh, yes, sir. My name is Bill. I'm located in Modesto, California. Okay, Bill. I believe, uh, Dr. Taylor, I believe that Madison Avenue has been using subliminal messages for, for years like a prior caller had said. Uh, particularly, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, are my thoughts predisposed or are they legitimate as far as the old Land of Lakes uh, uh, Indian girl kneecaps? Um, I've, they look like a, a pair of women's breasts. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's been brought to my attention several times. I have a good friend that is a professor, indeed, hmm. of uh, literature that is absolutely convinced of that. You know, the answer to a lot of these things, and I'm going to go back. I think the earlier caller's name was Jim. Uh, the answer to a lot of them, Bill, Wilson Brian Key, in his, in his book, Subliminal Seduction, Clam Plate Orgy, um, shows some pretty compelling evidence. In Subliminal Seduction, particularly, now I'll plug somebody else's book. I can't give you an 800 number, but <laughs> there is a <clears throat> color art piece. That sh it was a Playboy ad way back in the 60s this shows a beautiful woman barely clad breast unclad mm -hmm. holding a wreath and the the saying underneath is give him um give him an idea for christmas okay <laughs> now if you look at this wreath close up yes you discover that it's not what you thought it was a wreath of nuts it's really a wreath of genitalia and it's undeniable it is absolutely undeniable. So, I mean, the answer to your question is yes, Madison Avenue uh, and others have used it for years and years. In the area of research, Suzzalo began working with it back in, in the 1800s, 1894, off the top of my head is the, the date that's in my mind. In, in the area of the Sistine Chapel, he has an argument that uh, it was used in painting the Sistine Chapel. The question, however, comes... Is it intentional? Was it, is it, you know, is it possible that it's there because of the perceiver? In psychology, well, we look wait, at wait, something wait called thematic apperception. Doctor, I show you? Yeah? Doctor, it's possible that it's there because the artist felt it when he painted uh, uh, this. I was in the Sistine Chapel here recently. Absolutely. Uh, so the, the message may be there. And it may have been uh, subliminal on the part of the artist and absolutely honest. That's correct. I agree with that. Okay. All right. We don't have a lot of time, but we do have a lot of calls. Wild Card Line, you're on the air with Dr. Taylor. Hi, man. Uh, yes, you're on. Okay. Where, are you, where are you? I'm in Central California. Okay. Go, go right uh, ahead. My question for Dr. Taylor is uh, and more towards the mass news media, um, particularly the Rodney King incident. Could you... Uh, Characterize that as uh, the news media's handling of it as being kind of a subliminal suggestion to the nation through repetition and kind of biased characterization of uh, the whole incident as, you know, we were constantly bombarded with it as being called the Rodney King beating. Okay, yeah, uh, that's a wonderful question. I mean, it was shown 
ad nauseum on CNN and elsewhere. We saw Rodney King beat again and again and again and again. Now, surely there were a lot of messages in, in that, weren't there, Doctor? The answer to that is yes, but you know, I'm going to... You know, let's take it out of the subliminal context because to put it there, we're redefining what we're talking about. You're right. Let me respond to it. One of the things that happens when an authority repeatedly makes a presentation, yeah, well, there's two things. The first one is, you know, it, it has a direct effect on it. The second one is it is biased by the nature of the presentation. Now, to what extent that affects our behavior, that would be conjecture, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I guess I'm going to just scare everybody a little bit. Back in the 60s, Professor Stanley Milgram performed what I consider to be um, just a landmark study. All right, it's going to have to be quick. Okay, real quick. What he did is he elicited subjects or engage subjects to administer voltage to volunteers up to 450 volts for doing minor things like failing a trivial task, like a memory task. <laughs> the participants in the study continued, to per they persisted with delivering the voltage when he told them to deliver the voltage because he was the authority. Even when they whitened, they were sweating, uh, they shivered, they wept, they clearly were in psychological conflict. And that study was repeated in a number of cultures and has, has come to bear as this is the influence of an authority. All right, Doctor, we have barely scratched the surface. What an absolutely incredible program. I will have you back on Dreamland and probably on a coast show. Uh, if you want to get Dr. Taylor's book, it's 1-800-964-3551. Let me give that to you again. 1-800-964-3551. Only time, Doctor, to say thank you, and we will have you back. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you very much, sir. Dr. Eldon Taylor, good night. I'm Art Bell from Dreamland. Good night. A program dedicated to an examination of areas in the human experience not easily nor neatly put in a box. Things seen at the edge of vision, awakening a part of the mind as yet not mapped. Yet things every bit as real as the air we breathe but don't see. Please join us again next week at this time for Dreamland. We have similar interests, and so from time to time, we bring on people from Strange Universe. This is one of those times. Who's with us? Renee Barnett, Director of Research and Segment Producer for Strange Universe. She doesn't have most of, uh, much to do. Uh, generally, she just sort of sits around the, uh, uh, the uh, studio... Um, with her feet up on the desk most of the day, right, Renee? Uh-oh, you must have hidden cameras in my office. <laughs> 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 oh, I would love to have one day like that, or even maybe five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you. All right, now, we're on to something about about Bigfoot. Uh, how did you all get on to this, and what have we got on our hands here? Well, actually, I, I received a call one day, not too long ago, a few weeks ago, and uh, from a young man in southeast Texas. Uh, I got a message from him, and, and he said that he wanted to talk to me about something. And I think I might have even gotten a couple messages from him before uh, I was able to call back. And I did call him back. Uh, he told me of an experience that he had when he'd gone out to look at a piece of property that he was thinking about buying in partnership with a friend of his. Mm -hmm. uh, his friend couldn't be there, so his another friend of his uh, said, why don't you take my video camera and take some pictures, and, and then you can show the other guy, and you guys can decide what you want to do. Now we know why he had a video camera. That's right. That's okay. the reason he had. And what's funny is that... Um, he told me that he had never used a video camera before. This was the first time that he had ever even had one in his hand in, to use. And this, is, <laughs> this was the use of it. It was, it was amazing. But I'm going to let him get into exactly what happened. Okay. It wasn't just a sighting. It was an interaction. And that's what makes it uh, so incredibly exciting. But I was impressed with Danny. I, uh, I talked to him at some length and... Um, I just, I feel like uh, he's telling the truth. Seems to you like uh, just a regular guy? 
He does. He absolutely does. And, you know, he's kind of from the area of the country that I'm from. And I think, you know, we developed a rapport and we talked, as I said, for for quite some uh, lengths at, at various times. And um, I never heard one thing that really made me question his truthfulness. I, you know, usually you'll catch a little something that'll fl- throw up a red flag and you'll go, sure. hmm. No, that's right, sure. And including the fact that he wasn't trying to make a bundle of money, so which is which always adds to someone's credibility, I think. When uh, is and, and well, of course, you went even further. Other than your own intuition, you went and uh, corralled Loren Loren Coleman, I guess it is, um, one of the experts that you use from time to time. He is a um, zoologist, cryptozoologist, cryptozoologist, so an anthropologist. And oh, so he's. Uh, uh, he's a Bigfoot expert as well as a people expert. So I think he was the perfect person to first take a look at the video, and, and then now, tonight, on your show for the first time, he'll meet Danny Sweeten, who is the uh, Bigfoot eyewitness and videographer. So they're just now meeting. Absolutely. They'll meet for the first time, and I think that Lauren is definitely interested in asking Danny a few questions about his experience. And I'm certainly anxious to hear what uh, Danny has to say. Um, well, so am I. Uh, listen, I want to thank you for allowing me to be a judge uh, for your contest. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. We were, <laughs> we were so hoping that you would say yes, and you, and you so graciously did. It, it made my day, actually, sitting yeah. down and watching all of those very, very strange people. Strange. <laughs> For those that don't know, we're talking about the Strangest Person in America contest on Strange Universe. Uh, our winner will be announced, by the way, Art, on November 21st. So uh, those who are interested in the contest, which I hope everybody is, uh, should tune in on November 21st and we'll see the winner. There were five judges, is that correct? Yes. So then, then my vote contributed to one-fifth of the uh, total. That's right. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing... How my pick did. Now, um, <laughs> when is there are two things uh, before I let you go. Uh, one, when is this segment going to air on Strange Universe? Very important. It's going to air Monday night, this November com- the 10th. That's this coming Monday. All right. Now, in, in not only, I, I might add, or we, it's our monster night. We're, we not only uh-huh. have uh, footage of Bigfoot, which we hope and, and feel may be the first real evidence uh, of video evidence of Bigfoot in 30 years, but also we have come into possession of uh, something from Loch Lomond, Scotland that looks like uh, a Loch Ness monster. Oh, really? So it's going to be amazing. We're going to have that on also. And we had Lauren look at that, too. We just, uh, we took full advantage of Lauren Coleman, uh, and he was kind enough to give us his opinion on both. So. Oh, okay. We'll ask him about that as well. Yeah, then. we could do that. <laughs> All right. Uh, number two, and I want to warn the audience now, um, television, I've done some television, so I know it is a hurried, last-minute uh, kind of operation. Always. I mean, it's it's heart attackville. It's ulcer-producing. It's, I was really kidding, Renee, uh, very hard, because I know what television is like. It's a last-minute deal. And at the last minute, they, we tried to get a still frame from the video of the Bigfoot uh, the segment they're going to run. And we did get a still frame, but it is not particularly a good one. And when you can actually see the creature moving, uh, it adds a dimension that's very important uh, to be able to see at all. So it, it's kind of like Rorschach test up there right now. Go up and take a look on my website. And there is a picture, and you will see the Bigfoot there, but... We didn't, uh, perhaps we didn't get quite the right shot because things were so hurried at the last minute, right? That's absolutely right, and I apologize for that, but I guarantee you the video footage is much better, as, as Lauren and, and Danny can confirm, too. You can, you can see the, the uh, creature walking, and uh, you can see the way he moves, and um, you can see that very clearly. Oh, right. Absolutely excellent. Renee, thank you. And we will go on now and interview those who will be in that segment coming up Monday night now. Thank you very much. Bless your heart. Uh, That's Renee Barnett, Director of Research (laughs) and Segment Producer for Strange Universe, who I'm sure does not keep her feet up on anything for even two flat seconds. So, now, 
Uh, let us go. Let's see if I can push the right buttons here. Uh, let us go first uh, east uh, to uh, Danny Sweeten. Uh, Danny, is that the way to say it? Yep, that's the way to say it. All right. Uh, welcome to the program. Danny, uh, do you care to tell us where you are in Texas, or do you want to keep... Um, uh, do you want to keep some uh, aspect of uh, where you are a secret? Well, uh, I'm 40 miles north of Houston. 40 miles north of Houston. All right. right. And you went out to videotape this property borrowing somebody's uh, vi uh, video camcorder, huh? Yeah, well, I really didn't even intend to borrow the camera. It was just, you know, he said, why don't you take it? And he showed me, you know, roughly how to use it. And, uh... I ended up out in the woods with it, so, and that's, you know, pretty much how it happened. All right, now this is, uh, what kind of property was this? I mean, was it uh, just property in the woods, or did it include some woods with a cleared area, or what? Well, it was, uh, it was property that had been cleared over, you know, back in the 30s, probably. It had, uh, you know, a few pine trees on it. It would have been easy to clear for the purpose that, you know, that we were looking for the property for, which is... Sure. We we're going to put in a sheet range. Oh, you are a, uh, it says here you're 37 years old and you're a gunsmith uh, by trade. Yes, sir. Okay, so you were going to put in, a, that makes a lot of sense. You're going to put in a shooting range out there. Uh, have you ever seen any kind of monster before? Never. I mean, uh, this is the first time, you know, I had, you know, I'd heard of Bigfoot, and, you know, I heard y'all earlier saying, you know, Bigfoot. And I'm not going to say, you know, that it was Bigfoot, because uh, All right. All I, right. I really don't know what it was. All right. Um, what I want to do is uh, quickly bring in um, Lauren Coleman and uh, see if he's with us. Lauren, uh, are you there? Hi, Art. Hi there. All right. Now, what I want to do, uh, Lauren, is I want to be able to ask Danny to sort of tell a story. And I want you to listen, and if you want to interject and ask a question, he can hear you. I presume you can hear each other anyway. Uh, Lauren, say something. Hi. I'm um, over here in Portland, Maine, listening to him, Danny, so I'd be glad to hear your story. All right, Danny, you, do you hear Lauren? I can hear you fine. All right, that's all we need. All right, Danny, if you would then, tell us um, what time of day it was. Tell us the story of what you saw and what it looked like. Okay, it was... Uh... It was a little before noon, if I'm not mistaken. I don't remember exactly. But, uh, I had, I'll just tell it how it happened, I guess. Sure. Uh, I had talked the day before with the, to the man who's, you know, lived near the property. We've been friends, you know, all of our lives. And, uh, the guy that lives near me that was going to go in, you know, partners on the deal, couldn't make it. He's a, he works in law enforcement, and his schedule is constantly changing, so he couldn't make it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, that morning, I, you know, we went out to the property, and, uh, well, we went out to his house, and, uh, the guy that lives near the property had to go to work. So, uh, I would just have been, I would have been stuck by myself, you know, no, you know, me looking at it wouldn't have done any good. Sure. And he said, well, take my camera. And I said, well, I don't know anything about him. Uh, and he showed me, you know, he put the battery on and he showed me where to push the button and all. So uh, I went out through the back of his property to get over to the other place. I had never been over there before. I didn't know you could just walk across the fence. So I had walked, I don't know, probably less than a quarter of a mile up the fence line where it was, you know, clear path. And uh, I had walked past the spot where this whatever was laying on the ground. It was laying on the ground? Right. Uh, yeah. On its back, on its side, on its belly? Well, it was laying on, uh, it was laying on its side, propped up on his left shoulder. Uh-huh. You know, just like a person. He had his feet crossed, and uh, his right hand was laying on his right thigh, and he was just looking at me. So it was kind of like a relaxed pose? Right, like he, you know, well, when you look at the place, 
you can tell that he was laying in a spot where he could see, you know, any approach to him. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, whether he dozed off or whatever, I walked within 12, 10 to 12 feet of him. Oh, you were very close then. Right. And, uh, Des describe, if you would... Well, exactly what you saw. In other words, what did this creature look like? Was it covered with hair? Was it bare? Was it, it what? It was uh, covered with short brown, brownish black hair. Not, you know, I have seen the, let's see, it's the Patterson video. Right. And the reason that, you know, I said y'all were saying Bigfoot, and I wouldn't say Bigfoot is because the hair and physically... It didn't look much like that. But... Okay. Um, how was it different than in the Patterson video? Well, this was... You could see more skin underneath the hair. Uh. It wasn't like a long, straight hair. This was like short fur. Short, short fur, okay. Uh, we did it have... How tall was it? Yeah, how tall. Good question. Well, I'm I'm six one, and it was a head and a half taller than me. So that's probably seven feet or more. Little little better than seven feet. Little better than seven feet. Now I understand, Danny, that you had a your encounter got a little bit closer. Yes, sir, it did. Really? Uh, when I when I looked over and saw it, we just locked out, you know. <laughs> And uh, I had the video camera in my hand, in my right hand, in my left hand, I had a blue box that I had a, some orange marker tape, you know, you see the linemen tie it to trees when they're marking off property. And I had uh, a few uh, odds and ends and a, a little gun because I was going to do some shooting while I was out there. You know, I got permission, it was okay. And uh, when I when I saw him, my first reaction was to you know raise the video camera up. Not the not the gun, huh? No, nah, well there was no way it was in the box and it was closed and uh, <laughs> we were too close. Uh huh. So uh, it's running through my mind, you know. Look through the viewfinder, push the little red button, and I'm raising up the camera in, in the process of raising it up with my right hand I just dropped the box with my left and I looked down at the camera to, you know first time I ever used one I didn't know what I was doing basically and when I look up he is like nine inches away from me running flat out nine inches right he's it's just a big wall of fur and the next thing I know I'm doing a backwards cartwheel into the dirt and uh yeah i i can understand that